but the meditation prayers will be written up the back so that you can stay following us it'll also be on the website so you can do them at home so that'll be kicking off into the new year so the prayers the prayers are still out there but um, we'll be um, meeting back in the church again in the new year uh, other thing that too is that there's no night services until the 10th of January so if you come tonight uh, if you've got a key help yourself just have a good time um, but there'll be not many people here <laughs> so no services until the 10th of January alrighty well be God bless Lord thank you for the offering today thank you for the finance that's come in Father we're asking you to use that money Lord as this place just moves forward as with volunteers we would pray that you'd use the finance to extend your kingdom in this place that a city may be touched with the love of God we ask it in Jesus name amen and amen okay now we're ready for our message thank you Pastor Beth amen hallelujah let's say praise the Lord okay we are blessed we are so blessed to live in a Christian country and sometimes we forget that we're so blessed to live in a Christian country and you know when I was on the tent when we used to go on the tent Shelly Mann used to sing some songs and they were old fashioned songs but this this um this last week these two songs have just come back to me and I just felt really today just to to bring us to that place again of where are you with Jesus are you closer to Jesus today than you were last week are you closer to Jesus this year than you were last year and so I really felt you know with the new year coming so this song says this, it says, Just suppose God searched through heaven and couldn't find one willing to be. That supreme sacrifice that was needed that would buy eternal life for you and me. What would that be like? Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for that old rugged cross, had it not been for a man called Jesus, then forever my soul would be lost. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought if it had not been for Jesus? I'm going to ask you to stand because we're going to pray. Father, today we invite the Holy Spirit here right now. And Father, we ask you today... We cry out actually today, Father, because we want a fire. Father, we want a fire to burn in our hearts and in our lives, Father, because there are people, Father, that don't know you, that there are people out there in a lost and dying world. And, Father, there are people that think that no one cares. But, Father, we need to get your heart. We need to get a passion and we need to get the love of the Father, the Father's heart to come down upon the church. And I pray, Father, for the churches of Orange, for the churches of, this, of Australia, Father, that we have a heart. Father, we have a heart for you and a heart to see people saved and a heart to see the children know you and be safe and secure again, Father God. Father, as Islam and all these other things are infiltrating this world, Father, we need you more than anything else. And Father, we know, we know that you are the only answer. So we ask you this morning, Father, we ask you this morning, as, I, as the word comes out, Father, we ask you to burn in our hearts. And Lord, that intercession might rise in our hearts this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And we declare it out this morning that it will happen. Okay, so in the mornings we've been meditating. We've been bringing the Word of God and we've been just taking a small passage and we've been meditating on this passage. And then we've been praying and our prayer life at the end, it might only be five minutes, but it's been a passionate prayer time at the end. And uh, so one of these scriptures that we were, we've been looking at is Galatians 2:20 to 21. Now, I want to read this, but I want you to hear it. 
it's not just going to be the Bible verse, okay? It's going to be something that's going to really start to burn in each one of your lives if you want to be close to Jesus. And this verse says, I have been crucified with Christ. Paul understood this. Paul wrote this and he said, because of that man Jesus, because of what he'd done, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live. Come on, it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, so we're still on this earth, we're still living in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And we've just heard Dave just preach on it, just speak on that. Paul understood it. He understood if it had not been for a man called Jesus. And he understood what he did for him. And he understood that at that time you have to say, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And there's a little saying that says this, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, and that spells joy. So many times through our life, we're putting ourselves first and we're seeing people, lots of people around with depression, lots of people around with every, every other problem because they're not putting Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Because that is what the main commandment is, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then I tell you, church, that will be joy. That will be joy. It's only, you know, it's only for me whenever I start to think, hmm, I'm, I'm getting treated wrong. I'm, I'm studying. Um, I don't think people are caring about me enough that I start to get down and I start to get depressed and I start to, you know, get all sulky and say, well, you know, somebody should care about me. But if you start to think about the fact that Jesus never did that, did he? He never did that. And so we have that opportunity to say, as Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, which is down here, right? So we're still earthly, we're still down here, but we live by the faith of the Son of God. So is your life doing that? I had to check my life. Is my life living totally for Jesus? You know, and I looked at it and I thought, well, we spend a lot of time, you know, serving Jesus. But am I, is my life totally living for Jesus? If people would look at me, is there fruit in my life? If people would look at you, do they know that it's no longer Christ that lives in you? Uh, is no longer you that live, but Christ that lives in you? Do they know that? Can you be accused of being a Christian? Can you be accused of being a Christian? And I'm really challenging you this year, church. Let's let people know. Let's let people know. Let's get a passion for Jesus. You know, they say, if people don't know your passion, you don't have one. Okay, so I want to read an account now that really affected me. And this account I found on the internet, and it came from Duncan Campbell in the Hebrides Revival. And this was a young man that really believed that it's no longer I that live but Christ who lives in me and he was interceding okay this is Duncan Campbell and he said I was met at the pier by the ministers and two of his officers, office bearers just as I stepped off the boat an old elder came over to me and faced me with this question Mr Campbell can I ask you this question are you walking with God Oh, here were men who meant business. Men who were afraid that a strange hand would touch the ark. Are you working with God? Well, I was glad to be able to say, well, I think I can say this, that I fear God. The dear man looked at me and said, well, if you fear God, that will do. Then the minister turned and said, we're sure, Mr. Campbell, that you're tired and you must be longing for your supper. And supper will be ready for you in the manse. But I wonder if you would address a meeting in the parish church. 
just on the way to the manse to show yourself to the people. There'll be a fair congregation there. Um, you see, there's a movement among us. Well, it will interest you, dear people, to know uh, that I never got supper because I didn't arrive at the manse until 20 minutes past five in the morning. I went to the church. Now, this is the interesting bit because it deals with the outbreak of God in, a supernatural, in supernatural powers. The God of miracles revealing himself in a revival. I preached in the church to a congregation of about 300 and I would say it was a good meeting, a wonderful sense of God and something that I hadn't known since the 1921 movement, but nothing really happened. I pronounced the benediction and I'm walking down the aisle when this young man comes to me and he says, nothing has broken out tonight, but God is hovering over us. To be perfectly honest, I didn't feel anything. But you see, he was a man much nearer God than I was. Oh, he knew the secrets. We're moving down the aisle and the con congregation is moving out and they're all, they're all out now except this man and myself. And this man lifts his hand, his two hands, and starts to pray, God, you made a promise to pour water on the thirsty and floods onto the dry ground and you're not doing it. And he prayed and prayed and prayed again until he fell again onto the floor into a trance. This man had passion. He's lying there and I'm standing beside him for about five minutes. And then the doors of the church opened and the session clerk came in. Mr. Campbell, something wonderful has happened. Revival has broken out. Will you come to the door and see the crowd that's here? This was 11 o'clock. Mark you, 11 o'clock. I went to the door and there must have been a congregation of between six and 700 people gathered around the church. Now that man, that young man had passion. How many times are we in church and we go, okay, time's up, let's go. But that young man, Duncan Campbell never felt it, right? But he was able to say to that young man, when you know God, then I understand that you have a passion so he stayed with that young man and then it broke out. So this is the scripture that he was using. It's Isaiah 44, 3 and 4. For I will pour waters on the thirsty land. Are you thirsty, church? Are you thirsty? And streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessings on your descendant. And they sp shall spring up among the grass like willows by the flowing stream. Okay, another account of a revival is Brownsville. And this is another account of passionate prayer. John Kilpatrick, he was looking for a revival. He was believing. He knew that the church needed to be renewed and revived and set on fire again. So instead of having a church service on Sunday nights, he had a prayer meeting. But it wasn't like a normal prayer meeting because people came. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes. It wasn't like a normal prayer meeting. People came. Now, Steve Hill had a journal, and this is what Steve Hill, who was part of the revival, wrote. He said, I testify of seeing children lying flat before the Lord, some of them with fingernails sinking into the carpet, weeping and interceding over the condition of their unsaved loved ones. It was deep calling unto deep in the heart of the pastor and in the hearts of those in the congregation. A spontaneous, unusual moving of God's people under prayer has always preceded a remarkable season of the Holy Ghost outpouring. Can you imagine that? Children actually had such a passion for the lost that they were in those prayer meetings and they were calling out to God. They were calling out. And you know what? I really believe even today that there's children around here, and I know in many places, and we've heard some of the accounts, hey, Mandy, where children are crying out to God because it's unsafe in their homes. It's unsafe in their homes at the moment because their parents are drunks or their parents are alcoholics or they, and they haven't got fathers. They haven't got any safe, any secure places. Guys, I want you to hear this today. This is happening in today's society. People are looking for safe houses. We've got, 
we've got an account of um, somebody running to someone's house and saying, can I stay here tonight? It's not safe at home. Are we going to get moved? Are we going to get moved? Are we going to get moved? That's in orange that was happening. You know, Suzette had in. We're going we're gonna to actually go into a, a um, series of study on prayer so we can get real with prayer. And um, Suzette Hadding speaks about it in her book and um, every time she tells this story, she breaks down and she says, we cannot not pray. So this story is about a time when this is true, this is over in Germany and because they... Um, Suzette is single and there's a few others in the mission that are single and so they decided that they would go out and give gifts to all the people they had food and different gifts to all the people in the parks and places that didn't have anything and so they'd packaged up all these packages and everything and because they were going out and Suzette didn't realise what she was doing really and she walked through a hedge place in a park and as she walked into that hedge place she realised that she'd done something terribly wrong because a gun met her right there and the guy said, what are you doing? And she said, look, I, I've got gifts and, and I just want to give them to the people and, and she said, he said, come in. She had walked in to a drug den. She had walked in to the gangs and so she's giving out gifts and then she hears this almighty cry. And this young boy, they're dragging him down and they've got the heroin needle and they're putting the heroin needle into him. Sorry for the emotion. And she tries with everything that she can because they wanted him to be a pimp for him. You know, so... I mean, it's only young. And she tries with everything she can to get to that young boy to grab him because she doesn't care about her life. <laughs> and she doesn't. She is a powerful woman. She'll go into death row and say, look, let me in there. They need to know about Jesus. And they let her in. They don't let many people in, but she'll go in. And she's trying to get to that young boy to get him away. And they're holding her back and they say, we'll kill you. You have to walk out. She said from that day for intercession came into her life. She could not not pray. Church, we've been in walls for too long. If we don't see what goes on. I tell you, I've been, I did a... Um, I've been around these these houses because we did a, a, a knock one year with the Salvation Army and I think I prayed for about three families as I went through because I could not not pray for these families. There was a man that had had cancer and he couldn't do anything and he was by himself and I just said, look, can I pray for you for the peace of God? And then there was a young man, a young mother with heaps of kids around her and and she just had the worst headache and the worst pain and the kids were all around her and she had no one to help her either and I just said look could I pray for you and so many people out there just say yes please pray for me because it's some kind of love for them I hope I'm stirring you today I hope I'm stirring myself more today Okay, so now I just want to turn to Luke 18 because I want to show you something amazing about God. And in Luke 18, 1 to 8, it's about the parable of the persistent widow. And I, first of all, I didn't understand this. I thought, wow, God, that's not like you. But it's not about God in this. It's about the people that are crying out. So let's listen. It says, Then he spoke a parable to them that man always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was a certain city 
a judge who do not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not do, he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she will weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust said, God, the judge said, And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Tell me that he will avenge them speedily. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of God comes, will he find true faith on this earth? Will he find that passion? Will he find that passion? Now this whole story is about what God is trying to say in this. What, what Jesus is trying to bring out is this, this judge was an unjust God, uh, judge. He didn't really care. But God cares. God cares. God has such passion and love and he sees the pain and all he's doing is saying, is there any person down there that will see that pain? Is there any intercessor down there that will actually start to pray for these things? Whereas this unjust gu- judge, he didn't care, but he still, got, he still gave that widow the answer. Why? Because she was persistent, because she kept going. She, kept, she was passionate. It, it was her desperate cry. She could not, she had to plead. There was nothing else that she could do. And church, there's nothing else that we can do. There's nothing else that we can do, church. Because we need the God of heaven to pour out his righteousness on this place. We need the power and the presence of God. If we don't have that, we are lost. We are lost. Let's go to the next one in Luke 11, 5 and 10. It says, then Jesus is preaching more about prayer. And he uses this story. Suppose suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread and you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed and I can't help you. But I tell you this, though you won't do it for a friendship's sake, If you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and he will give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened to. Do you know that it wasn't, again, it wasn't because he was a friendly man that says, oh, of course you need that. It was because of the persistence and the passion that that man was knocking on the door. He wasn't going to go away because he needed to feed this man. Church. Let's not go away because we need to feed the people. We need to feed the people. We need to keep knocking. We need to keep seeking. We need to, we need to, to allow the presence of God to come down into this place. We need to get rid of every blockage in our life because, again, we've got to understand it is no longer I that live but Christ that lives in us. Jonathan Edwards says this, when God is about to do a mighty thing, and I think we know he is about to do a mighty thing in this nation. We know he is about to do a mighty thing because the Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises the standard and the enemy is trying to come in like a mighty flood and God is going to raise that standard and we are going to see a church rise up into the place they should rise to. Okay, and Andrew Murray says this, 
Revival must be asked and received directly from God himself. An extraordinary spirit of prayer constraining believers to much secret and united prayer, pressing them to labour fervently in their supplication will be one of the surest signs of an approaching flood of blessing. If there is to be a mighty divine awakening, it will be born in the wholeheartedness of our prayer and faith for it. Let no believer think himself too weak to help or imagine his prayers are not needed. Let every believer stir up the gift that is in him and begin to cry out every day, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? That's Psalm 185. Isaiah 33, 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you, and I will give you great and hidden things that you do not know. God is good. You know, and it goes on. If you go through the Psalms, <clears throat> you will find that David says, I called and he answered. I called and he answered. I called and he answered. You just go through the Psalms and you will see that God hears and he answers if you will will knock if you ask seek and knock you'll get what you ask seek and knock for if it's no longer i that live but christ who lives in me and i just want to close with this encounter because we can't do any of this without having that personal relationship with jesus without seeking his face and not his hands so I want to close with the Tommy Teeny account and some of you might have heard this and some of you might be really shocked <laughs> but Tommy Teeny gave this account in a worship atmosphere thick with God's presence at 8.30 service on October the 20th Pastor Teeny and Pastor Heard were hesitant to break a worshipful silence with their preaching. Pastor Heard had one point, at one point, leaned over towards Teeny and said, Are you ready to take the service? And Pastor Teeny responded that he feared going to the pulpit because he sensed something big was about to happen. So Pastor Teeny didn't budge. So Pastor Heard thought, well, I better do something. So he rose, and a few minutes later, he walked across the soft padded red carpet, mounted the 28 inch platform, and grasped the podium. And he read this And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek, crave and require as a necessity. This is from the Amplified Version. I've put it in. My face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear them from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. What the Holy Spirit is saying to us is what we should seek, that we should seek God's face and not his hands. Pastor Heard told the congregation, we should not be seeking just his benefits, but should be seeking also to know him. At that instant, a loud clap of noise hit the sanctuary and Pastor Heard was thrown backwards and landed eight or nine feet away, flat on his back. He laid uninjured, but overcome by the sense of the Holy Spirit's presence. Only a non-stop twitching of his right hand showed that he was still alive. The podium made of half-inch thick plastic material did not fare as well. It was split in two. And, um, and it was flung towards the congregation, but it didn't hit anyway, in different directions, landing six to seven feet apart. The base and the top were unscathed, but the middle was severed. The congregation was stunned. <laughs> Teeny gave several adult calls, and people kept coming forward, some falling in the spirit, and before they reached the altar, um, before they reached the altar, 15 and a half hours later at midnight, the meeting ended. There was no earthly explanation for what people had seen. 
but they knew that God had spoken loudly. So this morning, I just want to bring that challenge. Have we, have we got passionate prayer? Are we feeling our prayers? Are we crying out? Or are we going to a prayer meeting and looking at our watch, which I've done, <laughs> thinking, oh my goodness, it should be over soon, it should be over soon. Now Tim has said that one of our prayer meetings, we're actually going to get the bus and we're actually going to go around and we're going to look at what is going on and then we're going to come back and we're going to pray. But I tell you, we're actually hearing what's going on out there already. I've got friends that have got lost their partners because they've been addicted to ice and they're no longer good to be fathers they're no longer good to be trusted in any area or any way and they're hurting there's many people out there that are hurting because they've got nowhere to go now because they've actually um, they've actually burnt the bridges with everyone and then there's another problem that's out there and that is insanity and it's becoming very, very big. There is a lot of people now because of drugs and because of alcohol. They don't know where they are anymore. They don't know who they are anymore. And they actually don't have any control anymore. So church, this morning, we have an opportunity on, on um, New Year's Eve night to come and to declare and to pray. So I'm going to open up that invitation. If you have a passion to see things change in Australia, in Orange, in your family, if it not be for a man named Jesus, then forever our soul would be lost. So today, go home and open that scripture of Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. Can you say that? I have been crucified with Christ. Or have you been just too busy pleasing yourself? Too busy living in the world? Are you doing exactly what the Lord's called you to do? Because... Ephesians 2.10 says that you are his masterpiece created for good works before the foundation of the earth. Have you found what you've been created for? Are you doing what you've been created for? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you. I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. I thank you for the privilege of being saved. I thank you for the privilege of faith that you give us to believe the truth. Because many cannot believe it, Father, and I know it's a gift. And we cry out this morning, we ask for mercy for those people. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that the eyes of their heart be opened where the enemy has tried to blind them from the truth, Father. We speak against that blinding light today from the enemy and we ask, Lord, that people will be able to see the truth and to be able to, by faith, receive you as their Lord and Saviour. We ask you, Lord, to put a passion in our heart, Father, a passion for you, a passion to fall more in love with Jesus and a passion for other people around us. And, Lord, that... As we do put ourselves last, Lord, that it'll be, this will be a joyful year, a wonderful year. And we declare out that this new year coming is going to be a year of power and glory and that Jesus' name is going to be uplifted in this place and that, that there will be bread in the house in this place. 
And so we thank you, Jesus, and we invite you to come. We invite your Holy Spirit to come and take over our lives and bring us to that place, we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. If you would like prayer this morning, if you want to have that fire in your belly, um, Dan, can you just play for us? If you want to have that, if you have that passion, you want to have that passion, I'm really, um, Tim and me are here to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, and morning tea is on. If you would like to have a cup of tea, feel free to go and have a cup of tea. And thank you very much for coming. And I just want to uh, welcome my family here this morning. It's great to see you this morning. Um, go and say hello to them. They're awesome people. <laughs>